everyone, and welcome to our virtual First Friday Art Talk. Uh, my name is Hisela, and I'm the Adult Services Librarian at the Salinas Public Library, so I'll be hosting today's event. Um, we'd like to give a special thank you to the two artists who are presenting today, Linda Lay and Sandra Gray. Um, each artist will have half an hour, which includes time for their presentation about their artwork, but also questions from us. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Our first artist this afternoon is Linda Lay. Linda is an artist, writer, and teacher who recently returned home to Marina after studying and working in the Midwest and LA. So Linda's work ranges from digital to more tr traditional mediums. Um, you should see what she can do with uh, fibers. So her work is often autobiographical, humorous, crafty, colorful, and performative. Um, she's exhibited in LA, Brooklyn, Kansas City, Ohio, as well as San Francisco and the Monterey Bay area. So I'm super excited to welcome Linda. Thank you very much, Isela. I'm so excited to be here. Um, let's begin. It's been a while since I was able to do a presentation like this, and I'm uh, pretty excited. Linda Lay, a presentation. <laughs> thank you. I said already, thank you for coming to the first Friday Art Talk. Um, I'm so glad to see all of your faces. Several of you are very familiar. It's very nice. Uh, Hisela sent me a few questions, sent us a few questions to answer, so I figured I'd format the presentation around them. So my first slide here asks the question, how did I first become involved in art? I'm sure there's more to it, but the first thing I thought of is aliens. This image you may know is one from the Aliens movie, the Alien movie, sorry, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I was given a trading card um, featuring this little being from a loaf of Wonder Bread when I was a little kid, um, and, and it was a promotional item for the movie. Um, I hadn't seen it or anything, but I, and I had been making art in my little life, but it's the first memory I have of truly loving an image and wanting to recreate that feeling with art. This is a relatively large sculpture I made when I was in my 20s out of paper mache and cement and light bulbs for the eyes. And it didn't, didn't really work out well. It was a depiction of the creepiest childhood dream I had where I saw several of these on my windowsill um, and they were moving around very quietly and creepily in a quiet room and at the time I was really suspicious like why do I have this strange dream but of course I've grown up and I realized it's because I had that card and it inspired that dream probably so um, I first became in, uh, involved in art and trying to um, I guess this is expressing how I wanted to make something else um, to visualize something else and to share that with others so and then we move on to this picture of um, the eyes is what I call them. It's the artwork that you see in that picture. Um, it's the first art that I knew of, like official artwork, and my dad did it. Um, it's supposed to be the actress Cheryl Ladd. I don't think it looks like Cheryl Ladd, but I would never tell him that. Um, it was just eyes that creeped everyone out when they walked into the room because it seemed to follow you. Um, Cheryl Ladd in the TV Guide in the 70s. Um, I'm in my mom's stomach right there. Um, I connect though my love of the alien and kind of um, things like that to my dad because he was um, a horror movie fan and he really encouraged um, me to be a monster sort of Martian fanatic and you'll see in my work that that repeats a lot. And so I thought that was worth sharing. And then we move to Godzilla. I loved Godzilla. I love Godzilla. She was so funny and fierce and misunderstood. I loved that I didn't know exactly how to feel about her, but I decided at an early age that she was a she. I know sometimes she was a she and sometimes she wasn't a she, um, but she was my hero for whatever reason. Different people have tried to explain that to me. That's for another lecture. <laughs> and then here you see me um, meeting um, the actual Godzilla, uh, the person who is uh, who was the character in the costume um, in Pasadena in, in like 2015 or 2016 at an event called Monster Palooza. And um, I paid $30 to get the handshake and a 
an assigned autograph of him. He was like 90 something. And I asked his daughter, I said, which photo is his favorite? You know, I want him to sign his favorite image of himself. And she's like, he doesn't look. <laughs> he's like really, really old. <laughs> but he was, it, was, it was amazing for me, as you can see on my face. I was really, really happy. And it's one of the best things. I have it hanging in this little studio of mine. So we'll move on from there. And there's a picture of, um, I'm going to butcher his name, Haruo, <laughs> in the costume. He always seems so happy and cheerful. And you know, you can see the, the, the actuality of the, of the creature there with him in the costume. And it's just so cute and funny. And really, all that I love about, um, about Godzilla, I think, is that there's something kind of funny um, about the creature and, um, and heroic. So then we move on to this which is um, one of my first attempts at a GIF animation, a digital animation. Um, I did it in the 90s with this program called Fractal Design. I was just playing around. Um, but it strikes me now, as I am closer in shape to that character, um, that um, it's kind of also a Godzilla kind of form of this body of this creature. And I was always doing um, forms like that, which also seemed kind of bird-like. But I related it in, this, in preparing this presentation to Godzilla and to like, why is it that I create these creatures that, that look like that? Um, okay. And then we go to Sesame Street. Sesame Street started out around the time I was born. And the monster shapes and the fact that everyone there seemed to come from working families as I did made me feel like I was a part of their world. Sesame Street definitely felt like art to me, and I began to learn about Jim Henson's creative path as I grew older. In regard to the value of humor in my work, I could not get enough of Grover, especially when he played the waiter who seemed to live to terrorize that one customer with the fly in his soup. It, it just was the funniest thing to me. But again, you see that shape that you know all of the monsters really have, and they were just so wonderful, and, and obviously everybody likes Sesame Street everybody we move to speaking of characters that like to terrorize other characters uh bugs bunny bugs bunny's huge in my life i love bugs bunny um the expressions the movements uh the fact that he really only wanted some delicious carrots it seems at any given moment uh, but he was ready to face his challengers because someone always wanted something from him um, and then he'd rub it in when he took charge of the situation, like in this, um, the, you know, the Barber of Seville. Was it still called the Barber of Seville? Um, it was visually elegant, though, the artwork, the, the backgrounds, and just the movements. Um, and I love that. It was, I didn't get exposed to art in galleries and things like that, so that was art to me. Um, and it was just beautiful comedy, uh, which I have grown to appreciate. Um, I knew I wanted to somehow make that who I was. And then we move to the only childhood drawing that I have, but it's only a photo that I have now. Um, I guess it might be a culmination of all those things that I showed you before. This character being more like Bugs Bunny in drag. Um, notice the prominent front teeth, like the rabbit, and I also have them. It was much worse when I was a child. Um, and also Martians, and somehow Mae West is in there. Um, like many of us, I was always in front of the TV, and this feels like a direct reflection of that. My second grade teacher hung this in the class, and I was very pleased. School, both teachers and my peers, was my best support system as an artist, and that's how I gained confidence in my art life. And here it says, I hope some hunks, badly spelled, come in handsome, very handsome here on Earth. So that's uh, why my aliens land on Earth. <laughs> And now, um, this was me and my brother and my mom um, about the time that I drew that alien babe uh, right here at Marina, where I am now, Marina, California. But I'm sharing this to show the groovy jumper that my mom made herself um, and how being exposed to handmade, bold fashion was also something that caused me to be the kind of artist um, that I am today. Fashion is, uh, is an important part of my work. Uh, the fabric came from a shop called Sprouse Ritz in Marina. I don't know if any of you guys remember that, but um, my mom and I both worked there um, at different times during the 80s, never at the same time. But it's a little, it was a shop that sold fabric and, and it was, it was a, a place that, I, it's a place I miss. 
And then we move to movies. My life as an artist connected to fashion um, made sense as I grew into myself. And these three movies in this order uh, were incredible influences on who I am today. Desperately Seeking Susan, Pretty in Pink, and the last one, Slaves of New York, which was the one that directly referenced the lives of artists, devoting their lives to their art. I felt very connected. All three of these films showed creative women with very little money, wearing found or repurposed and handmade items, that, and they could navigate through different social landscapes. That was, as an artist, who I was and who I aimed to become. The next question, art school or self-taught? Did I go to art school or was I self-taught? Well, both. I wanted to be a fine artist, but I didn't have the support system in place to do so as a young person. I went to beauty school instead, um, you know, to be creative and earn a living. I eventually dropped out because I was terrible at it. After that, I worked at a job having nothing to do with art and began to teach myself what I could. Here is a watercolor I did of a model in a magazine in the 90s. I was trying to, to learn, trying to grow. It's what I had. It's kind of big. It's a big watercolor paper piece that I framed really nicely. This is my first attempt at oil painting, self-taught, also done in the 90s. I bought only two tubes of paint because it was expensive. During this time, I read about Andy Warhol, Frida Kahlo, Keith Haring, and it's when I discovered Jean-Michel Basquiat. This sculpture was about three feet tall. I made the baby aliens out of a bag of gym socks and used hot glue uh, and a hot glue gun to create the illusion of drool. It made me laugh, um, kind of like a prop sort of image. It was a time in my life when I was thinking about whether or not I should have children. So I noticed in looking back at all of these images, I was like, there are a lot of these baby things. And that's really what I was thinking about. Like, I never wanted them, but I could. So um, here I am, you know, drawing these grotesque babies um, from outer space. There's a close-up of, of what they look like. I put little beads on their, on their mouths as teeth. I think they're so cute, though. Um, and then here, we've got something that is a little more um, sweet and creepy at the same time. Um, it's a small piece. Uh, for work, I assembled electronics. So I translated my newly learned skills with wire into my art practice. Um, it's a little alien baby that could be moved in and out of the pouch, um, out of the mama's pouch. So, um, and then I put some, um, it was paper mache with some, um, a, I think I put epoxy uh, resin or something on it and then painted with that um, tester paint that you would paint model cars with. I used to use a lot of it. And then we've got the last baby kind of thing. Um, this is not the best photo but it shows the evolution of that personal exploration around motherhood. I decided it wasn't for me. And, um, and of my creative growth, I went back to watercolor as I did with that one image from the magazine, um, but moved away from the representational and pretty stuff I was trying out. I just had to know that I could do it um, before moving on. And then this act of, of doing something to prove that I can do it to move on, I still do to this day, I repeat over and over again. And then here, is a painting that I loved at the time. Um, it was moving into oils on board. Um, it was a, kind of a medium sized piece. Um, I like that I decorated the frame. I show it because I do that a lot now. I like to have the frame be a part of the image. Um, but I thought it was sweet and cute and I really liked the way that I, it made me think of the cartoons I liked and how the hands moved the face. Like it was very textural. And then we move on to the next one, which is interesting to me. Um, it was my first failed attempt to create a series of works. The idea was to embrace living my whole life in tourist areas, the Monterey Peninsula, and then I live in Santa Cruz. I fought the request from people in my life to create paintings of local landscapes and lighthouses and boats. Eventually, I kind of gave in because I've seen works that are great, you know, with that sort of um, subject matter. The aliens in this project were literally touring the communities I lived in. I thought locals would like it and I would stay true to myself by sticking with my familiar characters. I didn't have enthusiasm to continue with it though. It, I was inspired by work by the artist Charlie White um, to do this. Um, it was much, his was much more challenging and sophisticated and I was disappointed in my attempt and I'll show you now. This is, it's a bad resolution image I grabbed from the internet quickly. Um, but this was the piece that, I mean, I wanted to be that and I created that really sweet sort of, I can't, I think I'm dark 
and um, and you know all that stuff. But I'm just always end up being you know weird or cute. Okay, but not weird enough apparently. So then we move into a new landscape. Um, this is all part of my my self teaching. I, I feel like it was a huge step in my uh, progression as an artist. Um, so there I am with a uh, fake Elvis, um, who said he was married to the fake um, Marilyn Monroe that was on the Hollywood Boulevard. So um, yeah, I moved to Los Angeles, specifically Hollywood. And then here, um, I knew I wouldn't grow if I didn't challenge myself. Um, I knew no one there. I went to Beverly Hills and show my work, showed my work to hair salons and cafes, and some agreed to show my work and allowed me to put an ad in the local uh, weekly paper to hold an opening reception. I did this in a few places around town. People just handed the keys uh, to me for, uh, to their businesses and I'm still overwhelmed by their amount of trust and very grateful. So yeah, I just would go to the places next to the galleries and I would ask to show my work because I was, you know, I was, I was very green, very new. And then I would make these flyers and, and advertise um, in the local papers and people would show up and it was a little party. Soon, I found an unexpectedly affordable space on Hollywood Boulevard um, and I opened up shop. It was a little hallway sort of area in off of Hollywood Boulevard, but the address was Hollywood Boulevard. Six, seven, what was it? Two, seven and a fourth. <laughs> um, and that's a picture of the first shop. I had two spaces here. Um, as you can see, I took all these things that I was making in my life on the peninsula and was like, I'm gonna sell everything and I'm gonna make a living being an artist. Um, and so that was my, my first sort of shop space and a lot of tourists, it turned out, go to Hollywood Boulevard, so I couldn't get away from it, but I learned so much. And then here you see that alien head sculpture, it's at the door, um, finally has a purpose, <laughs> the one that I said I constructed badly. And there's my little sign, I called it Lindelay Atelier, someone gave me that idea. And then soon, a larger space opened up across the way. I realized I was less interested in selling handmade trinkets and more interested in creative growth. The new space allowed for more privacy so I could work and not necessarily engage a lot of customers only when I was ready. And it really taught me a lot about how to receive criticism because people didn't know I was the artist and, and it was hard. And, and I learned later on when I, um, well, I guess I'm getting ahead of the story. I'll tell you that later. <laughs> so um, here, my art exploded all over the walls. I worked every day and even my old work finally seemed to have a home resolution picture but the place was just filled I painted the walls and everything um, it was a magical time and it was difficult I was learning how to listen to the muse is what I would say and being in a town where so many people arrive from their small towns to follow their dreams felt right if not super manic um, I made a lot of bad art I started trying out performance art as well it was all mostly a disaster but important for my evolution and eventual decision to go to art school here are a couple snapshots from one of my last shows in LA at a cafe. I wanted something more than showing at these cafes. Um, I began t attending lectures by filmmakers, artists, and writers, and considered going to college. It turns out that life, that life altering year in Hollywood led me to an empty bank account and to the Midwest, to Missouri, where I thought I was just visiting, but I decided to apply to art school, the Kansas City Art Institute. I got in and one of the first things I had to do was draw wood over and over and over again. I was aggressively interested in expressing the personal and I did and still do, but this was the beginning of learning to place my small world into something larger. And then this is what the final project of this wood exploration was. You can't really see it too well. There's a whole bunch going on there. Um, I said that um, most of my classmates, at least one is here, um, they were very 18 years old or something and I was 32. So I had like a lot of life stuff to put in my artwork. Um, so it's funny to see all of that stuff in there. People are like, why? Why so busy? Why so much? Um, it's another foundation year project, more successful, where I added in video performance. Um, I filmed myself going through emotions that I guess I couldn't express publicly. Um, I was heavy into symbols. Um, what with my new art history classes, I was in heaven in school. I got a scholarship to live in the dorms. I didn't even have to buy toilet paper. And then here, um, it's not the best work, but it feels like the seeds for what I'm doing now were planted here. It's on a bed sheet um, and it's uh, sewn onto a giant frame and I painted on it. 
um, along with a found object sculpture I made it junior year. At the time, I thought the story and the objects were most important, but now I see it has everything to do with form. Now I'm working with fiber and tightening strings on frames is really like what I started doing there. And then this was my senior, um, senior project. Uh, one of the people who collaborated with me on this is here. Um, for my senior project, I ended up integrating my holiday experience with my time in the Midwest. I wrote some ridiculous songs and performed them in a way that confused people, but it made sense. Um, sorry, it didn't make sense. It made some people laugh, and I liked that a lot, integrating humor into my work. So I made a set and I performed some songs. So I'm getting, I thought I was going to be short, but I might be uh, just in time. What is my inspiration? Um, here we have an image I did senior year as well. I love the idea um, of something that lives beneath every day. I also love dancing. And then here is a slide that might not show up. It's of this project that I have. Um, I'm not going to play the video. Oh, it's showing up now. It's on YouTube and it's called After Work Anger Dance. Um, and if you want to check that out, you can go to YouTube and see it. It was where I was dancing, um, free form sort of dancing after work. Um, it's also on Instagram if you want to follow my Instagram too. Um, I do. I haven't done it in a while, but I'll be getting back to it soon. And then the next one is going to be another kind of video thing. Um, that had to do with um, finding text and emails that um, that were random. There's nothing showing up there, so I'm not gonna, oh, there, I need to click it again. Um, it was called Spin Jar, and I saved weird text that was in spam email that seemed like some kind of, could be a secret message, and it had the name Spin Jar on it. So I saved them years and years from 2004 till 2010 or something, and I um, created a poem, and I made this video and, and made a puppet, and it's kind of a goofy, but kind of, looks like I'm being very serious, which I kind of am, a uh, video that was a part of a literary magazine um, in, I think, 2011. Um, and then we go to um, this, uh, to, to, I'm also interested in form, like actual form. I love working with fibers and fabrics and creating something from a different thing. I made this each part when riding the underground train in Los Angeles to and from work every day, probably around 2016. So I forgot to mention, it did say, what is my inspiration? But these are some things that inspire me. And then I moved to this picture of me with my friend, one of my oldest friends at an art event at LACMA. I'm wearing a, a thing I made from some rejected fabric and stuffing from an old pillow. It was weird, but also glamorous for the event we attended. Fashion inspires me. It's art that we all engage in every day. So how do I create works? I guess I'll start with this one. Um, these are some granny squares that I made. Um, I was doing it sort of to keep busy while my dad was in hospice care at home. Um, I was going to make a blanket for my friend um, as, a, as a present, and um, I found out that afterward I couldn't get rid of them, um, and I didn't really know what to do with them, and I, and I didn't really want to sell it or anything, so I put it together like that, and it's behind me now, a little bit more closely put together, and so the way that I formed, create that, created that work had to do with the experience and how I felt about, you know, the objectivity of it, the, the form formal aspects of it, what it meant to me. And then here are some um, pictures of uh, studio space uh, spaces that I've had at um, Open Ground Studios in Seaside here. Um, this was one that I briefly had um, just to show how I create works. I, I have to put a lot of things around. This one was when I just got there um, and I put things around. I see how it works. I make a mess and um, and like this stick thing has now evolved into the fiber arts that I'm doing now, which you'll see in a minute is um, quite different than like that's another studio space. These are shoes that I was doing representational works. I skipped through all that, that stuff. Um, I can explain that another time. <laughs> but this is more of the work that I'm doing right now, which are large scale frames and I'm taking um, string and I'm, 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 I'm weaving different types of yarn that I get um, from thrift stores, uh, people give it to me. i sometimes I buy things. Sometimes I've had things for a long time. Um, let's see, what was I going to say about that sort of stuff? Yeah. Um, sewing, I'm comforted by the process. I love a creating form from something as wispy as strings and bits. So how do I create in this case, I'm really involved in the act of moving string across and stitching. And, and I even use a felting, like stabbing the fuzzy things together to create this form. Um, and, and it's very pleasing for me right now. So that's, that's recently how I've been creating things. I'm also adding some paintings to this um, body of work. 
um, this is a huge piece, it's not done, but I want it to have the same kind of energy as these creatures that I'm creating with fibers. I skipped a lot, so I didn't talk about how this was going to be a part of a show at CSUMB Selena Center, um, but then COVID happened. And so, um, so we had to stop and I've been taking my time with it, um, but I'm really in love with the process. So it's comforting, especially now in this time of COVID, which leads me to something that someone else that's here, I'm collaborating with my, Ryuno, I don't know if I say your name right, um, but it, we are doing a collaborative project called RFCC, Relation, Fashion. Um, it's over time, so I have to stop soon. Fashion Creation Connection, where we're making fashion for each other. So we're going to be doing this on our social media accounts. You could check us out to see how I create, how she creates, how we share with each other, and how we deal with the isolation of COVID. So that's me. Um, that's me saying... Um, goodbye and um, thank you for listening and I welcome any questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much. It was super fun getting insight into your childhood inspirations and lifelong fascination with monsters. Um, so as Linda said, if anybody has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or you can also write them in the chat box and I'll go ahead and read them out loud. Um, I wondered, Linda, um, it seems like you've almost like caught up with your personal narrative in your work and like you don't need to tell like construct a narrative around your work anymore and then I just imagined that now you're like a director like you said you love working with form and that you're like really physically involved and I wondered if like you have a narrative that you're building now within working in each piece or like as yourself almost like it's a performance um I wondered if you have any like construct for when you're working in those new weavings yeah. It's like a way that you see yourself or yeah. do they build their own narrative now? Do they build? Do Maybe they... it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, it's, before it was a lot, it, was, it wasn't It was so, I'm more, I'm distanced from what I'm doing. I just because of the stuff that, you know, I've experienced all this with this person, Sarah Luther, by the way. Um, the things that we've experienced, I've experienced and you've seen in the past um, they were far more diaristic and I needed to put myself much more into the work. And so now I feel distanced from it and I am looking more at the form and I'm, yeah, and I'm stepping back more like a director, like, this is what I do. These are the monsters that I use. What are you going to do today? And what are you referencing in art history? What are you referencing in the world? Yeah, that's a nice observation. I really appreciate that. Uh, I have a question, Linda. Um, so I know you're working with fabric a lot now. Um, what is one of the biggest challenges of using that medium? Well, um, I think it's been a long time of people telling me that, well, it's going to get dusty if someone puts it in their house. They're not going to want to buy it. I don't, and I, I would make things that didn't necessarily have frames. So now with me using the frames, it's almost like here, it's framed. <laughs> and so the challenge, I guess, has been just the issue of me having confidence of presenting the work um, in fabric. The, 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 the stitching uh, and the weaving and all of that comes very naturally. I've been sewing. I didn't mention that in my past, but uh, while well, I did in, in showing my mom's work, I've been around sewing and I have been sewing since I was a small child, mending things. So it comes very naturally to me. It's almost too comforting for me. I almost feel like it's not fancy enough or it's not sophisticated enough as I guess is common in like crafty art, right? So I think it's mostly psychological <laughs> more than tactile. Does anyone else have any other questions? I saw a comment here from Dorothy that said, you've lived an interesting life. It was great to see how your art has evolved. Oh, um, that's very nice. Actually, during the pandemic, I know you mentioned that you're working in col collaboration uh, with Mai to do a fashion project. Um, have you noticed a change in your artwork? Like, have you started moving in a new direction during lockdown? Well, I think the, um, the work that I was supposed to show last spring, um, I'm, I'm allowing myself to have a lot more time with it. So not speeding myself, not, not speeding up, not, not having to rush has been the change that I noticed. Um, but as far as the content and maybe how I'm feeling and what is there for me to see about like, you know, my emotional state during all of this, I think I won't be able to know until I do another presentation a few years from now, you know, because it's all so here right now. Um, but I'm just thankful to do it, to keep busy. So I, I guess that's what I'm feeling. 
All right, well, thank you for answering our questions. Uh, before I introduce the next artist, I'd like to talk a little bit about an upcoming program we have. So our new genealogy basics workshop. So if you're interested in your family history and want to give genealogy a try, it can be tough to sort out what resources are out there and how to best use them. So this introduction covers the basics to help you explore with confidence. You'll find out what resources people use the most, how to gather information from family and friends, uh, making the most of the internet and more. So you can register online and if you have any questions, you can contact Kathy Andrews. I'll make sure to include her contact information, uh, the registration link and the details like the date and the time um, of the workshop itself in the chat. I'll also stick around at the end of our event in case anyone has any questions about this workshop or any of our other upcoming library programs. Um, so now I'm happy to introduce our second artist of this afternoon, uh, Sandra Gray. So Sandra is a painter, a poet, and a photographer, and a retired elementary school teacher whose motto is, I specialize in not specializing. Always ready to try something new, Sandra finds joy in mastering different techniques or untried materials. As founding chairperson of the Seaside Artists Association, vice chairperson of the Seaside Art and History Commission, manager of the Avery Gallery, and owner of Grace Photo Tours, Sandra has been an active participant of our vibrant art community for more than 40 years. So I'm super excited to welcome Sandra and learn more about her story. Okay. The first thing I said was that I'm learning how to do the Zoom. <laughs> Obviously, I have a lot to learn. <laughs> and uh, as you said, I'm, I started out as a painter and or actually just drawing, mostly self-taught because um, I really learned a lot from the library. I used to go to the library in my neighborhood and it was like within a few blocks from where I lived. So I would go there and learn how to draw different things by checking out the different books from the library. And that was in elementary school. I was drawing when I, I can't remember a time when I wasn't drawing or making something. I would go out in the backyard and dig up uh, the clay in the, in, the, in the yard, in the lawn. My grandmother didn't care and I, I was always drawing whatever I could find that I that took my interest. I'll start with my slides and I'll start with paintings. Uh, the one on the left is uh, an example of some of the, uh, the type of drawing that I like to do where I start in one area, like maybe the eye or the lips. On this one, I started on the lips and I just kept adding hearts and the lips are hearts themselves everything in this painting or drawing is, are parts. And then when I finished the drawing and when I finished filling up the page, I needed a painting for an art exhibit at, uh, in Salinas at the little place where eight, they used to call it 831. Teresa Sullivan uh, has a, a, a bookstore and uh, it's like a, place where you can go to learn about Salinas and art, the art world there. And she has art walks on the first Friday as well. Anyway, she had a broken hearts exhibit. And so I took a, a print of this drawing on that I printed on pink paper and I cut it and tore it to make a broken heart. And then I painted the areas in between. I expanded it and painted the areas in between red. And then on top of that, I put uh, a poem. Uh, you can't read the poem because it's too small, yeah, but if you can zoom in, I you can read the poem. And it's about having a broken heart. Hmm. If there's a way to zoom it in, I'd read it to you. But the next picture painting is one I did um, of uh, a fisherman. I did a whole series of African images for Black History Month one year. And this was one of the paintings from that series that I took from mostly uh, different magazines and uh, paintings and not paintings, but photographs that I found online that I could use for the 
basis of my inspiration and my paintings. And I like this one of a fisherman because my father loved to go fishing and this kind of reminded me of him. So I did the thing of a man in a dugout painting, or I'm sorry, I keep saying painting, uh, fishing. Uh, these two were put together because they're about the forest. And this is from the frog pond here in Delray Woods. I did a photograph of the, I did a whole series of photographs in the frog pond. And I like this particular one because of the Spanish moss and the, the, the way it was composed when the photograph was seen. I, I developed into photography later because I really fell in love with digital photography, but um, this painting, uh, the area at the bottom, I uh, developed a lot because I just really liked the way the root system had all kinds of uh, darks and lights, and uh, I got carried away with an interest with the uh, root system of this tree. And then the, the owl, one of my last paintings, I did this one in uh, Gail Tears' garage because I was painting almost every Sunday there and there's a group of, of women that we get together and we all paint. And now since the uh, pandemic, I haven't been back, but uh, I painted this owl because I, I wanted to do an owl. It, I just, I had never done a bird. So I said, well, I'm gonna try painting a bird. I like doing different things because once I've done it, um, and gotten good enough at it to suit me, then I want to try something new. So feathers are hard. I found that out. <laughs> <The hard way. laughs> and, and anything that has lots of detail takes a lot longer than you expect. So you have to stop thinking about how long it takes and just finish. I enjoyed doing the background too, because I could just take whatever was in the background and kind of blur it out and make it interesting, but still have the colors and the uh, shapes and the darks and light that made the focus of the painting pop. So uh, that's why I enjoyed doing this painting of an owl. And here's the, uh, the painting that's in the background behind me. It's very large. Uh, it's done from a series of photographs that I took at sunset on Carmel Beach. You can see the house there that's on the point, kind of on the edge of the beach that everybody recognizes, it's pretty famous. And I, I like the drama of the uh, black uh, uh, against the sky because of, of the branches, it just, made the uh, composition interesting. And then the couple, the way I did the couple was different. I cut out the couple that's walking on the uh, sand in, at the beach. I cut them out of paper and glued them on the painting. They were, it wasn't, I'm not sure if it was paper or plastic. I think it was plastic. And I and I glued them on and then I made sure that they looked like they were part of the painting. So it's really a collage. It started out as a painting, but it ended up a collage. And I was learning how to paint waves and water and mountains and sky at the same time as trees. So mm -hmm. it was a very difficult, but uh, I learned a lot in this painting and I, I taught myself that I could do landscape and seascapes with this painting. This is a painting I did from a photograph that uh, my stepdaughter sent me of her daughter, a little carrot head, uh, beautiful little girl walking with her uncle in a pumpkin patch. And I just love that photograph. So I did a painting of it. Uh, I didn't take the photograph, but I liked the way it was composed and the colors in it. And it was fall when, it, when I painted, when I started painting, but it took me almost a year to finish this painting because I'd start it and stop and do something else and start it and stop and something else. It was, it was pretty difficult too, once again, because of all the different details in it. 
the, the one next to it was another one done at the frog pond. And there's a place there where these two trees are right together like that. And there's two benches there and it just looks so inviting a place to sit and just enjoy the nature. So I painted it and I liked the way the sun was coming through the trees. Um, after I finished it, and this is one of the smallest one I've done, I think it's only eight by 10. And, uh, I w had it sitting on the my hearth and the sun was coming in through the blinds and it made sunspots on my painting and took photographs of the series of sunspots as they went across the painting. And that was a very interesting experience for me. Painting, I actually sold this painting. It's a painting done from a, a photograph that I took at the beach here in Seaside. One of, on one of these days, like we have now with the waves are really, really big. And I think they call them, um, oh, they had a special name for them. The surfers go out and uh, they really look forward to these special waves that are so big in this area. Uh, but I enjoyed the way the waves captured the light and the seagulls. And then this is just Marina, I believe, behind the, in the background. Because uh, there's a place where you can, you can walk from Monterey all the way to Marina if you stayed on the beach without getting off the beach. And this couple was just walking in on the beach and enjoying the high spray and the beautiful landscape around them goes into photography I have a uh, two friends that I met when I first came here uh, and we used to go chasing the sunset and I went to Pacific Grove and I I took a lot of pictures from um, from Lover's Point all the way to Asilomar and this was my favorite shot. In fact, I use it on my uh, business cards. But the sunset finally came and I caught it. Because sometimes if you get there too late, you miss the sunset because the sun goes down a lot faster than you expect. Uh, this is the butterfly house in Pacific Grove. My husband Willie um, had a job there fixing their garage. They needed a new flooring in their garage. So I spent the whole day there taking pictures because I was amazed at all the butterflies that's on this house. I, I have no idea how many. And I, I recently read that he passed away, the man who, who attached these butterflies to his house. He did that because his wife was losing her eyesight and he wanted to have something big enough and uh, something three dimensional that she could enjoy uh, on at her house. So he put all of these butterflies all over in the front yard, all over the sides, and even the garage is just full of butterflies, three-dimensional butterflies that he attached. We can see this is from uh, a home that's in San Ardo. Uh, it's over 300 years old, the, the rancho there. I've got to meet the um, the over 100 year old owner of the ranch. She um, let me go around and take pictures. And the building in the background is the bunkhouse where the cowboys and rancher helpers used to live and sleep as after they finished taking care of the animals and, and the ranch. Um, they didn't grow that much other than grass for the horses and hay, and I guess, but it was mostly for cattle and horses. And I just, I called it um, the ghost tree or the spooky tree or something because that's what the tree reminded me of, a ghost or something, the, the way it was shaped and the dramatic uh, background it, it gave to the rest of the picture. Uh, I enjoyed taking pictures that day. I was there to um, help actually to give a ride to a chimney sweep who was up on the roof and I took lots of pictures of him on the roof doing the chimney because he lived with us and I helped take care of him 
His name was JC. And he used to, when he first started being a chimney sweep, he would wear the top coat and hat and top hat with the tails. And people would touch him because it was good luck to touch a chimney sweep. So he brought that tradition to the United States and he carried it on. But he wasn't wearing the top, the tail and top hat when I took him to the rancho. He just had ordinary jeans and a, a, sh a shirt, plaid shirt. <laughs> but he was really quite a talented person. I don't know if very many of you recognize this cross, uh, but I, I'm glad I took this picture because we, remember it got cut down and disappeared. And then there was such an uproar that it came back but they wouldn't put it back up because some people didn't want a religious item on the beach. And it, it was to commemorate uh, when the uh, Spanish um, explorers uh, discovered our beach here in Monterey. And the building in the background is the, the hotel on the beach in Seaside. And I, I'm so happy that I took this picture and I, I kind of treasure it because it's no longer there. The cross is gone. <laughs> I took a series of really fun shots at the aquarium. I, I don't know how many I took. This was during the time when they had the uh, seahorse exhibit. And I just love the anemones because they just float and come. Seem like they're always going down. I never see them going up. I thought that was interesting that they never look like they're going up. And you can even, even this one, they look like he's turning, but it, you never see them going up. It's really interesting how that works. And there's a leafy seahorse. Um, you can tell it's a seahorse by the, by the nose and you can barely see the eyes, but uh, that's one of my more favorite uh photographs that I took at the aquarium that day. And I remember it especially because that was the day I took my father to the aquarium and he really enjoyed it. Uh, that was the only time we went there together. Uh, so the aquarium is a special thing. This one I took the moon in Las Vegas from my car while we were driving on the way with an iPhone. So I was amazed that it even came out. <laughs> But it was from a moving vehicle, and, but I just love the, the cloud cover, and I cropped it so it looks like there's nothing else around it, but the, um, the picture was a lot bigger, but I cropped it so it just showed the uh, cloud cover and moon on that day. And the next one is the same, was the one I took after that, but it shows more of the cloud cover. It was a cloud cover that was interesting to me because it was so interest, uh, just looked like a storm. Of course, there wasn't a storm because it was in Vegas in the in the desert and they don't have any rain. <laughs> and that, this one I took, to, I put in this series because I always went to the blues festival. It was here and it's very sad that they're no longer having it even though the pandemic would ruin it anyway. But this was one of the performers and I like this particular shot because I was always trying to get uh, an image coming out of the dark because I've seen that done with uh, photography a lot but it's not easy to do and I finally got one with the people in the background as well as the singer and I've done drawings of, uh, of just the image coming out of the dark when all you see is the light shining off their faces and was my favorite of that type of work. I've done all kinds of events. I love doing events. Uh, I do events for people. They they pay me to do uh, weddings. Not so much weddings. I don't do weddings too well. People are never happy with their wedding shots, so I just don't do weddings. <laughs> but I've, I've done all kinds of uh, different celebrations and uh, the festivals around here, especially the Blues Festival and the Reggae Festival. Here's the photograph that I did the painting from. Uh, it's a, I always do 
a little bit different with my paintings because I see something in the painting once I start and I just let it develop. And I don't really care that it looks exactly like the photograph uh, because whatever develops in the painting is more important to me. And this is also at the Frog Pond. Both of these are from the, at the Frog Pond. Uh, I did a walk and I went all the way around the circle and I just love the drama of this one on the right uh, path going off into the greenery. I actually sold this photograph to someone whose mother was living in Hawaii and he bought it because it made him think that she can see the same sun that I can see. And he, was, he, he could feel that when he was standing on the beach and Carmel, he, used to, he said he liked to go there and watch the sun go down because he knew that his mother was on the, was right there where the sun was going down. So I, I was really happy that he bought the painting and I mean the photograph for that reason. But this was taken at Carmel Beach on the same sunset where I did the painting of a couple walking. And let's see what the next one. And that, this is part of that same series because the, the I call it peachy sunset because of the color of the spray and the, I like the, drum, the drama of the trees silhouetted against the background of the ocean and the sky. This is a family in that same series walking their dog with the dramatic silhouette of the trees. I've done this as a painting and a lot of people like the painting. I've sold some of the prints of the painting. And here's my website where you can see a lot more of my paintings and drawings and photographs. And here's my email underneath. And I don't care who has my email. I get them all the time. I don't care who has my phone number. If you had that, uh, you could call me and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, does anybody have any questions for Sandra? Question. I'm wondering if, um, uh, are you doing just photography now or are you alternating between photography and painting? And also, do you ever sit in a space and paint or is it usually photographs that you take and then paint? Um, I never sit in a space and paint, just like I never do photograph, uh, portraits when I paint. I don't like doing portraits because people are never satisfied with my portraits because I don't care that they don't look like them, <laughs> but they do. So <laughs> we have issues. <laughs> and and um, right now I'm doing mostly, I'm doing all photograph photography because uh, I don't have a place to paint other unless I want to go to like Gail's house, but I don't want to expose her to any germs and it's just too, iffy. We're both at the age where we need to stay at home right now. And that's what I'm doing, but um, most of the time. But uh, yes, I do mostly photography right now. Juan mentioned that he really likes your work. Um, and if you can type your website on the chat. So I actually included um, the information for Linda and Sandra. It has their website and their social medias. Um, so if anybody's interested in checking out more of their work, feel free to uh, just look in the chat. Does anyone else have any other questions for Sandra? I'm, I'm curious to know, Sandra, you said you like to experiment and try new things. Do you have something else that you're hoping to try soon other than photography and painting? I've done sculpture, all kinds. I've done jewelry. I've done uh, ceramics, um, wire sculpture with all kinds of wire. Uh, I love doing sculpture because it gets me away from black and I, it's, it's another challenge. Uh, right now, I don't have a space at home to do my artwork because uh, we had to sell our, our storage unit and all of, our, all of my artwork is in my studio. Well, that's not, not my studio anymore because we had rented out. And so I'm in the process of changing the, our storage shed that we still have into my studio. But tomorrow we're having a big sale to get rid of all the things that my father left 
and all of our stuff that we don't want. It's amazing how much stuff that we have. We have something for everybody. So come to my house to see what you can find. There might be some art frames if I can find them. <laughs> Everything's such a mess. Just trying to get it ready. But that's my little uh, plug for my <laughs> my uh, estate extravaganza. It's for my father's estate. He passed away last month. So I still have a lot of things that he left me that I can't find space for. <laughs> so it needs a new home. Sandra, I'm sorry to hear that your father passed away. He was a great guy. Uh, what time are you running your estate sales? It starts at nine and ends at four. And I'm going to try to do a, a Zoom <laughs> uh, uh, sale tomorrow at, if my daughter can come and help me. But <laughs> otherwise, it'll be a, like a FaceTime Zoom. <laughs> uh, we'll see what happens. But I advertise it on Facebook and hopefully I get enough people coming and people who can't come can do the Zoom thing or the FaceTime. Uh, Sandra, Jan mentioned that you do wonderful masks. Um, can you talk oh, a little bit more yeah. about that? Oh yeah, I started doing masks in a class called Arts as Healing. Um, with Linda Hevern. She was doing classes at the Boys and Girls Club and uh, she always had us do masks. That was one of her, uh, she would supply the masks and then we would decorate them with paint or pieces of uh, paper or all kinds of objects that she would bring and uh, magazines. We'd cut out the magazines and put them on. I, I like putting feathers, boas around the edge of the mask and I gave one to my uh, cousin for her birthday. She was really happy with that because that's the one she really wanted. <laughs> and uh, I, I've done lots of masks. I've taught uh, mask making to the students that I was teaching at Oldemeyer. We had uh, art classes for teenagers. And uh, yeah, I like doing masks this time. All right, I know we've run a little bit over time, so thank you to everyone for joining us today. And once again, another special thank you to both of our artists uh, for speaking at today's event. Um, if you enjoyed it, we'd love to have you back at our next First Friday Art Talk. We're actually taking a little break during the holiday season, so we'll resume the series next year in February. So it'll be Friday the 5th at our usual time, 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. Uh, make sure to check out our Facebook and website for more details to come in the month of January. Uh, but otherwise, have a good weekend, everyone. Hey, thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for sharing. <laughs>